know if we rushed here and get through things, but we were talking about water processing. And uh, this is uh, where we had finished off talking about disinfection. And uh, so for disinfection, we had of course talked about uh, chlorination. And uh, I had mentioned that uh, sometimes we don't necessarily always use chlorine, sometimes we use those chloramines. Anyone remember why we might use the chloramines versus chlorine? Um, not quite. They're a little bit more persistent. So depending on your distribution system, and in the case of Fort McMurray, where we're trucking water around, uh, chlorine will stay in the water for, I think it's usually about 24 to 48 hours. If you're expecting it to, to be uh, in a system longer than that, the chloramines are a good fit. Um, and that's kind of the main reason. There could be economic or other reasons. Uh, anytime you're using chemicals, of course, they're interacting with machinery and all of the other chemical processes. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, just from trial and error, we find out things are a little bit more efficient. So I want to talk a little bit about ozone and uh, uh, Blaine? passing permanganate. Uh, yeah. Uh, is, is the chlorine you're talking about, is this the same chlorine that is in sw swimming pools? Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's different, like as I was mentioning last day, there's different ways to put in the chlorine. Um, it, traditionally, it used to be chlorine gas, which is, which is really bad <laughs> uh, and, uh, and very toxic. And, uh, but um, most systems now are using, um, they're, they're adding it sort of indirectly, uh, basically adding uh, salts of hypochlorite. Um, so just take a look at those notes from last day. And uh, so it's usually a sodium hypochlorite or a potassium hypochlorite. And, that, and, that, and that's the powder that you would see them adding to swimming pools. So at a, a, a treatment plant, uh, just scale that up. You know, rather than a scoop of it, you're talking about giant barrels of these powders they're adding in. Um, although, like I said, in, in Fort McMurray, we're using the chloramines, which is kind of a, a, a little bit more stable of a, of a system. And isn't sodium hypochlorite in like bleach? Yeah, and that's basically what bleach is. Yeah, it's just uh, an aqueous solution of sodium hypochlorite. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about ozone. Uh, that's ozone there. Um, it's kind of an interesting organic, or not organic, it's kind of an interesting chemical. Uh, you know, you may remember uh, from Chem 101 talking about resonance and stuff, uh, uh, but it's, it's three, three oxygens. And uh, it's, it's really quite a reactive compound. Um, and so uh, and it has a very strong oxidizing power, which means it'll destroy a lot of things, uh, mostly organic chemicals. So uh, ozone is very good at, um, at uh, disinfecting water, and you can see all those things that it's going to remove and react with besides organics, things like iron, manganese, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so, you know, depending on your water source, uh, it can be a very effective uh, method to not just disinfect, but also take out uh, bad tastes and odors. Uh, I thought I had... Yeah, I meant to get you a picture of um, some places, uh, not Fort McMurray, we don't use ozone here, but there are some water facilities that use ozone. And um, it is a little dangerous as well. Uh, if it leaks, you know, there are, you know, people can obviously ha have accidents and whatnot. And so it's not necessarily used in every place. I don't really know what the considerations are as to why we would use ozone versus other things. Um, I think that there was a uh, time, um, a few decades ago when it was kind of the new hot cool thing to do and so there were a bunch of plants built maybe 30 25 years ago um, my hometown invested in ozone um, I don't know like I said I, I don't think it's cheaper I think it's actually more expensive um, but maybe they've you know again I don't know what the what the reasons why you would design one system or another there's a really big one in um, I can't think of the name of that place um, Blaine, I have one question about ozone. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, is ozone poisonous, like, to us? Well, it's, it's a gas, right? And um, I'm not exactly sure what happens when you, uh, when you inhale uh, it in, in enough amounts, but I know it is dangerous in, in that it, you get very sick and possibly life-threatening high concentrations. So um, it's not something we want to inhale? It's no, no. And, and sm small concentrations of ozone are made um, through processes that we do all the time. Uh, so I think welding produces a little bit of ozone gas. Um, I think uh, lightning does as well. Uh, and, and, you know, other, other processes. So it's something that, uh, well, you probably know that a welding shop has to be well ventilated, not just because of the ozone, but there's all sorts of toxic fumes that you could potentially get exposed to but it is one of the dangerous gases that they, that they would like to avoid.
So another uh, thing that's used, this is also used in the Fort McMurray, is potassium permanganate. And I like potassium permanganate because it's purple. Uh, purple's, you know, it's a nice color and it's always exciting when you're in the lab and you have something that's colored because uh, everything just is, you know, white or transparent. Uh, so potassium permanganate is KMNO4. And it's also a relatively strong oxidizing uh, substance. And uh, so I'm not exactly sure why we use both chloramines and potassium permanganate. Um, potassium permanganate is also relatively persistent in the, in the, in the system as well. And uh, um, so uh, maybe they just feel that, uh, you know, uh, one or the other, maybe both together are more effective than one or the other. I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, so I know we were talking about uh, either the, I think we were talking about the flood uh, a while ago and how there was the boil water advisory uh, after the flood. And um, I, I did receive a notice in my mailbox about, uh, you know, the boil water advisory. And the other part of that notice, it said your water may be a little bit pinkish in color. And that was because at the time, just to kind of make sure the systems were um, disinfected, they put a high concentration of potassium permanganate into the water system. And um, it's not toxic to humans, um, but it does have a little bit of a pinkish color if you have it in small concentrations. And they were, they were saying that if your water is pink, it's not, not a concern. It's, it's, it's us doing our job trying to disinfect the systems. Um, so I think that uh, I've, had, uh, I've had that in my mailbox at least a couple of times now over the years. I'm trying to, I just can't remember what the other circumstance was. Uh, Blaine, one more question. Uh, yes. Have you ever had a, had a situation where uh, one of you, like you're, like I had it at my old house a couple of times, but uh, like, well, like, have you ever noticed like sometimes your water is like brown or yellow in color? What oh, for sure. Well, did you have, uh, did you have well water or anything like that? I don't think so, but it was, but it was like yellowish in color and it tasted kind of funny. It definitely wasn't well water. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't speak with that, that circumstance. I mean, my, my parents had a well and the water definitely changed colors uh, with the seasons. Sometimes it was clear and other times it had a, a tinge of yellow or, or brown. And there was that even one or two years where it was, the color was quite strong. I remember filling the bathtub <laughs> and you're like, whoa. <laughs> But, uh, you know, usually it has something to do with the minerals that are in there. Okay, so um, moving on. Uh, something that, uh, that most places are either have installed or they're planning on installing um, is UV radiation. Uh, this is relatively cheap, doesn't take up a lot of space. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, a large shed kind of is the amount of space it needs. And um, this is kind of being introduced, uh, I, I don't know whether there's funding for whatever or whether it has something to do with the standards, but uh, they're starting to introduce, like I said, at most water treatment plants now, probably because the cost is relatively low. And the whole idea is you're hitting um, the water just before, it's kind of the last step before it goes out of, um, out of the treatment center and into the pipes. Uh, they're hitting it with uh, some high intensity UV radiation. So you probably know there's UV radiation out there and it can give you cancer. Um, or sun, sun tans or sunburns, um, they're actually using uh, even higher intensity uh, UV radiation. This is UVC they're using. UVC is the type of radiation that actually uh, we, um, we don't get it here usually from the sun because of our ozone layer. Uh, and that's why we like our ozone layer. Uh, so we don't get the UVC uh, and it will uh, basically break DNA. So you can see what's showing on this picture here. And they're trying to show you that the nucleotides themselves is actually breaking the bonds and, uh, and basically causing the DNA to become uh, non-functional. So it's not necessarily killing the microbe, um, but it's sterilizing them so they can't replicate. So they can still metabolize, um, but they're never going to replicate because their DNA is damaged uh, beyond repair. So what this is doing is, like I said, it's kind of a last ditch effect after we've done all the water treatment, just to make sure that it, just in case there are any microbes still left over, uh, or maybe if you have Giardia, which is resistant to chlorination, if it's in there, uh, we're gonna hit it hard with some intense radiation and um, they're not gonna harm anybody. So like I said, it's relatively cheap. Usually you've got uh, a system where water is flowing and uh, there's some sort of uh, lamp in there and then the water, like I said, is kind of just flowing out uh, into the pipes at this point. I thought I had another picture of that. I know I have some pictures of the one at the wastewater treatment plant because uh, they're doing that for wastewater treatment as well. So um, 
These are almost all the processes. We've already talked a little bit about uh, fluoridation, of course. And we talked about fluoridation as being um, for uh, basically for, for teeth health. Um, we're not necessarily adding sodium fluoride directly. That might be what you'd have in your, um, in your toothpaste. Uh, most places are using these other things here, this uh, sodium, I always forget the name, silical fluoride and fluorosilicic acid. Um, and I think that has something to do with the cost, right? Uh, toothpaste, you know, people are willing to pay like $4 for a tube of toothpaste. And, uh, the, you know, um, but people aren't willing to pay $4 for a glass of water, right? Uh, kind of thing. Not that it would be quite as much. Um, so these chemicals here are... Um, are, are pretty dangerous uh, as well. And uh, uh, we used to have water fluoridation here in Fort McMurray. And uh, at one point they showed me the room and, it, and it, you know, there were like acid holes in the, in the floor and things like that, places where there had been spills. It's quite, these are quite concentrated uh, um, acids. Of course, when they're put into the water, uh, they're diluted, you know, many thousand full and, and they're not dangerous anymore. Um, but there's a cost as well. And uh, I, I believe uh, here when they upgraded their system, there were two things that were kind of happening simultaneously. One is they saw it as a, as a cost saving measure. So I think it's about a for McMurray. I think they were saying it was maybe a million dollars a year. And uh, the other one was that um, the standards had changed in that how much fluoride you allowed to have in the water had actually decreased. And we do have natural fluoride in our water. Uh, so they were thinking, okay, we don't want to exceed that, uh, um, that maximum concentration. And, um, and, and so, you know, it's like basically that's how it comes into the decision. And, and usually when I talk to the water treatment people, uh, sometimes I'll ask them, you know, why, um, you know, why are you fluoridating anymore? And I get different, different answers uh, who you talk to. It's always very interesting. Uh, the last guy I talked to said, well, you know, we really need to do it because most people have access to toothpaste, right? Um, that was his thought, um, but it's always something interesting to ask people about. I think I had mentioned before, you know, I was, I was telling you that there is, um, there is a, a network of people out there uh, that are dead against fluoridation. Um, and uh, it, uh, it does smack a little bit of conspiracy theory stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, this was my, uh, my first couple of Google attempts. One was just water fluoridation. And the first was Canadian Dental Association. Number three was the Fluoride Action Network. And uh, they kind of gave it interesting reasons why we should fluoridate and why we should not. Um, but, you know, the science is there. It does help teeth. Whether we should do it or not, I don't necessarily feel too strongly about it or not. Um, I think that uh, probably the number one thing you can do for your teeth is brush and floss. <laughs> um, flossing for sure. Take this from somebody who, you know, when I was a student, I, I didn't do a lot of flossing. And then suddenly I had a lot of cavities. And uh, so now I floss every day. Um, every single day for I don't know how many years, I probably missed um, flossing uh, maybe five times in the past 10 years. After having those cavities, I never wanted to do that again. And tell you, it's made a big difference. So that's kind of the basics of water treatment, right? Uh, you know, all these steps in here, um, you know, the coagulation uh, and the filtration and the disinfection are kind of the three most important parts, right? You're getting out the, uh, the uh, the silt and the solids from the coagulation and flocculation, uh, you're filtering out things, and then you're, you're uh, killing anything that's left by disinfection processes. I was going to show you, um, I had drawn on the board, um, I, I guess something that looked like this. This was something out of it. This one's out of a textbook. It's a little more professional than, than what I had done. Um, i sure if I was uh, a little bit more artistically inclined. You can see they're showing rivers and lakes and, and um, so, so lake water tends to be cleaner than rivers. Did I mention that before? Anyone know why that is? This is generally not 100% the case. I thought right, river water was cleaner because uh, rivers are always on the move and lakes always stay in one place. Lake water tends to have less clay and sediment. And that's because a lake, in a sense, is a giant settling tank. It doesn't mean it doesn't have other things in it. But for the, uh, the for the sedimentation part of the um, of the treatment, you know, they usually lake water requires way less uh, alum and uh, and sedimentation because it's already kind of done. Uh, depending on where the outtake is, of course, right? 
Uh, rivers pick up a lot more silt and clay. Uh, and so, uh, and of course, you know, you've got all the geology and other things to consider, but just kind of on general, lakes tend to have less, uh, less solids in them for that reason. Uh, like I said, it doesn't mean necessarily anything else. So you can see, like I said, those are the kind of the big parts of it, the flocculation, the settling, the filtration, and then the last steps are the disinfection. Sometimes there are other things in there. Uh, and I'll talk about a few of those other things in a minute. One of the other things, of course, being fluoridation, which is an optional kind of thing. So if you're interested in seeing uh, of this all together, uh, I recommend you check out this video. I'm, I'm going to skip over it for time, uh, but this is the city of Saskatoon. And uh, they're kind of similar to what we do here, um, which is one reason why it's a good video. So I kind of want to talk about a few other things. Uh, like I said, they're just kind of footnotes. And these are things that may or may not happen depending on you know, where you are in the world, right? So you can see this first one is taste and odor control. Uh, this is uh, pretty common in some places, depending on the geology. You can imagine that some lakes are really in rivers are very pristine. Uh, others are not. Uh, my hometown, uh, we get our water from a river, and uh, it's not big and vast like the, uh, like the Athabasca or Clearwater River. It's actually a pretty small river and fed mostly by swamps, <laughs> right? Um, and the water is pretty decent, but uh, kind of like what Fahad was saying, it definitely has a brown color to it and a little bit of odor to it. And maybe that's why they actually use the ozone. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but, uh, you know, often uh, these are things that we have to consider. If there's a taste or an ozone thing, or sorry, taste or an odor issue, uh, ozone might be, um, uh, might be a, a way to solve that issue. Or there's also different filters, carbon filters and things like that that can be used in some cases. There's always, uh, different, um, always different challenges based on the water source. Uh, groundwater, as I mentioned, sometimes uh, the ground may have, uh, it may be quite clean on because it's got a natural filtration going on. Sometimes it's picking up various things, uh, such as minerals. Uh, and uh, so sometimes that has to be uh, dealt with in various, in various ways. So one thing that is done in some places is water uh, softening. And uh, this is something that is not done in Fort McMurray, but I got the impression from talking to one of the technicians that they used to do it like a long time ago, like 20 years ago or something like that. So I don't know why exactly they stopped doing it, um, again, sometimes it's economically uh, um, motivated or sometimes, uh, you know, other, other variables change in that, uh, you know, anytime you're adding chemicals to the water, you're, of course, adding more stuff to the water. We want the water to be clean. And sometimes when we add softening chemicals, uh, it can actually make the water start to taste a little bit salty. So one of the ways that we um, often uh, get rid of water hardness is adding something called soda ash. So soda ash, you can see, is just uh, basically sodium carbonate. So you probably know now that water that's hard is caused by calcium and magnesium. And maybe you remember Chem 101, remember the solubility rules? Is that Chem 101? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Solubility rules? Yeah, so, so basically calcium uh, and, and, and when it binds with carbonate, um, it's, it's not very soluble. So you're basically precipitating it out. So in this whole case though, you are adding some sodium to the water. So like I said, you kind of don't want to make the water salty, but this is kind of one common way to do it. And uh, you're, you're removing a lot of the calcium and magnesium out of the water. Uh, there are other uh, systems. This uh, slate lime is sometimes also added. And uh, you can see, uh, oh, I think I have another chemical formula here. There we go. So you can see what happens here is that the, the lime is going to react with calcium bicarbonate and also make that precipitate, right? Calcium, calcium carbonate, right? And uh, it's, uh, you know, just another method to do it. Um, if anybody has a water softening system at home, it's not this system. Um, it's a little bit of a different chemistry. I think I've got a slide for that as well. Oops, wrong button there. So if you have a water softening system at home, you're doing something called ion exchange. And uh, you probably, anyone have one at home, a, so a water softening system? Maybe you've seen at the grocery store these big bags of something for water softeners. Uh, so what you're doing with these big bags of water softeners is it basically has sodium in there. And uh, what is going on in the system, maybe you can see it's got these little beads in there. These little beads are some sort of polymer. And what the polymer does is, uh, 
what you do is you charge it initially with sodium ions. So you're adding sodium to this, uh, this filter. And uh, these little beads have a system where what they do is exchange the sodium uh, with the calcium. So they take the calcium out of the water and they deposit sodium in it. So anybody who's had a, a water softener system, sometimes again, the same issue happens is uh, if the water is really hard, um, you're replacing the calcium with sodium and it starts to taste a little bit salty. But this is essential though in some houses. Um, my understanding is uh, sometimes people have systems, I think if people have that hot water on demand, um, they say it's, it's important to have a water softener uh, to make sure the system doesn't get clogged with, uh, with any scaling from the calcium and whatnot. Another system you may have heard of is something called reverse osmosis. Um, a lot of uh, bottled water is, can be made this way. Um, there's a lot of industrial processes that do this as well. Uh, so they take the municipal water and they're putting through an extra layer of, of cleanup in order to uh, get ready, rid of any dissolved ions. So if you take a look on the left, you probably know how osmosis works, right? You've got this, uh, you've got a membrane here and um, you've got, uh, you know, a salt solution over here. So you probably think of, of, um, of osmosis in terms of a cell and what happens when you put a cell into salt water. And uh, you probably know if you, get, um, if you get flowers for Valentine's Day or something, you're not gonna put it in salt water, that's gonna kill your flowers. It's gonna actually take the water. So what happens is the water will cross the membrane from a high concentration to a low concentration, and that will drain all the water into your flowers. So what do you do instead is you put your flowers in pure water and that's going to allow water to go into the flowers. So reverse osmosis is exactly the opposite of that. Rather than allowing osmosis to happen naturally, you take a, a solution you can see here on the left. Here's my uh, uh, untreated water. You add pressure and it pushes through the membrane, the pure water and the salts get trapped in the membrane. So this is not uh, something that is usually done in, um, in large amounts, unless it's for industry, where they can afford to do it. Uh, for drinking water, we're not usually doing this kind of thing because uh, you know all that pressure and those membranes, they're, they're, they can be quite expensive. But uh, for bottled water, where people are willing to pay a couple, bottle, couple dollars for bottled water, uh, why not, right? So one of the last things to mention is uh, uh, desalination, and uh, this is um, this is huge in some parts of the world. Um, we don't have a single desalination plant in Canada because we have lots of water, uh, but they're starting to build them in the United States, and they're building them. Uh, they have them all over Australia, and uh, some of the wealthier um, Middle Eastern countries have them, and and. Uh, uh, because, well, they don't have a lot of fresh water. So where do you get water from? You can use salt water. So desalination is basically um, a distillation process. So you heat the water up, vaporizes, and you condense and collect the vapor and it leaves the salt behind. Um, this takes energy, electricity, um, burning the fossil fuels. So it can be, it can be quite expensive. Uh, so I think I had mentioned before, my, uh, my nephew lives in Sydney, Australia. And he has a quota for how much water he can use. Uh, and if he goes over that quota, the price for his water um, skyrockets, right? And this is because much of the water in Sydney is, is uh, gained from desalination. And uh, it is uh, an expensive process uh, to do so. Um, but sometimes this is all you have, right? Like I said, you know, you're in Dubai, you're basically in the middle of a desert. Uh, and at least in Dubai, they have, uh, I guess they have lots of fossil fuels there to, uh, to do something about it. Um, so there's lots of people, you know, talking about how can we improve this process. You know, a place like Dubai as well, of course, is uh, they have lots of sun. Uh, so people are experimenting with figuring out whether you can do this, uh, you know, using solar energy um, and, and other alternative uh, uh, systems. And, and uh, you know, this, this could be a major breakthrough, you know, sometime in the future if somebody can figure out how to do this a lot more efficiently. At the moment, it remains relatively expensive, but uh, it is a, a solution for some places, of course. Um, I think uh, Israel uh, has a lot of these uh, set up as well. Again, a country with a little bit of money and living near, um, near the ocean. So one thing about uh, desalination is uh, it produces a lot of waste. So here's some numbers. I was looking this up 
And uh, so one liter of fresh water produces about one and a half liters of brine. And so what do we do with that brine, right? Uh, kind of depends on exactly where it is, um, but it's a lot of brine water. A lot of places they're dumping it directly back into the ocean, which um, let me just say the fish don't like it. It basically will kill a lot of, uh, a lot of plant and, and animal life uh, near where the outlet is. Um, I'm trying to remember, I was reading what they did in Australia. I'm trying to think whether they had a place where, I guess, the feel was like something like, it just sounded like tailings ponds that they were hoping would evaporate and leave the salt in front, but I really can't recall. So um, I, I guess I mentioned this already. Um, when we treat water, we are adding stuff to it. And uh, so this is something they do need to concern themselves with, you know, with all that balance, you know, we're adding alum, we're adding, uh, you know, if you're softening the water and those kind of things and all these things as well may affect the taste of the water and, and other parts of it. So these are, these are things that are kind of uh, just sort of an afterthought to think about in terms of water treatment. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Fort McMurray and um, I'll finish up today. Uh, there is our water treatment plant. So it's, uh, you can see it from the bridge. And uh, the water intake is, there's a, a little pump station right here actually. And this is the Athabasca River and we have these two reservoirs here. So number one and number two. And I think I have some information about those re reservoirs I'll talk about in a minute. Over here, this is where the, the water treatment plant is. And actually these are municipal buildings in general. So if you ever go over there, it's not just water treatment. Uh, there's a whole bunch of municipal offices that are, that are over there um, and, uh, you know, offices and different departments and whatnot. So if you do ever go over there, you're going to see water treatment and probably a whole bunch of other things. So here's some information about this. Um, so the two reservoirs are about 600 megaliters, apparently. So that's about a week of water. And uh, that's good because uh, sometimes, you know, we do want to stop our intake from the river. I think I mentioned before when we have the uh, ice breakup, uh, they just stop taking water from the river. It just gets uh, the turbidity goes, you know, from from being in the in the dozens to like the thousands, uh, you know, within a matter of hours. And uh, it's just not worth cleaning that water. Might as well let all that stuff flow through and then and then uh, take the water back in when it's a little bit cleaner. So there's some numbers for you. Um, 30,000 cubic meters per day uh, is about what, our, uh, about what we're, we're running at. And the capacity is, is much, much larger, um, I guess, so that we can have population growth or if we have things like forest fires or, or whatnot. So how many megaliters is 30,000 cubic meters? Any other conversion is there? 30. Yeah. That's correct, 30. So 1,000 cubic meters is one megaliter. And so that would be, of course, 30 million liters, right? So I found this little graphic. They used to have a nice little website talking about water treatment um, locally, and it's, it's no longer functional, but I, I managed to grab a picture. And uh, you can see they're showing the different steps here. So I just want to talk a little bit about these steps. You can see it says here, water pumped in from the reservoirs. And uh, another reason to have those reservoirs is uh, it gives a chance for the water to settle. Um, the turbidity of the water that's taken into the reservoir by the time it goes to the plant is actually reduced quite a bit. So yet another good reason uh, for having those. Um, then they do the coagulation flocculation stuff. They're using the alum. And you can see number four, it's talking about, uh, you know, we get some sludge and the sludge just, uh, yeah, that sludge uh, from the flock basically goes to the landfill. Um, they have some other clarifiers here, number five, where there's some more sedimentation. They have uh, some sand filtration, and they have UV. And the disinfection actually happens before this, which is funny that they do it here in this diagram this way. But because uh, the UV is, like we've said, it's the last thing to basically be done. And of course, there's some water doing there. So I'll just share with you some of my notes uh, about this. Um, they're actually not necessarily using uh, aluminum chloride. They're using something they call PAC, which is polyaluminum chloride. You can Google that. It has a, it, it's mixed with a polymer. I'm not exactly sure what, um, uh, what the polymer is. It probably is a trade secret. Um, but uh, you know, when I've asked the uh, technicians out there, they said it's more efficient. 
So um, I don't know whether it's more efficient just generally or if it's more efficient with the system they have. They actually have two coagulation systems and two sedimentation systems. One was built before the other and both uh, are, are different uh, technologies and they're actually using uh, different coagulants for both of them. Um, so one system was probably, the newer system was probably designed to be compatible with this PAC, this polyaluminum chloride, but it's basically aluminum chloride, which is a coagulant. Uh, these are mixed in a rapid mix tank. And then, and then I showed you those, uh, those big paddle mixers that uh, uh, mix things relatively slowly and allow the sedimentation to occur. So there's the clarification tanks. Um, I had mentioned last time, I think this was where we found a little minnow. So it kind of got in there and uh, well, it probably wasn't gonna survive much longer because it is getting as close to chemicals and, and is about to go through the sand filter. Um, but that happens once in a while. Uh, fish gets through. I'm not sure exactly how, but it does. Oops, wrong button. So the filtration, uh, I showed you some pictures. They have four filters and um, they clean them every 48 hours. So there's usually two or three running at any given time and one filter being cleaned and backwashed at any other time. So disinfection, like I said, they've got a lot of different things going on. Um, they have the, uh, uh, so here, here's how they make the chloramines, by the way, because we're actually using three different chemicals here. So calcium and sodium hypochlorite. I, again, I don't really know exactly why you need both calcium and sodium hypochlorite and uh, uh, why not one or the other, but uh, basically that gets mixed with ammonia and it makes the chloramines, which is right here. There we go. Um, ammonia, by the way, is pretty, like you don't want to be playing around with ammonia gas either. It's, uh, it's pretty noxious stuff. Uh, potassium permanganate, I mentioned, and of course the UV. I'm running out of time here. So I just, I, I don't really have a lot left, so I might keep you one minute over time today. Uh, other treatments, um, like I said, they apparently they used to deal with the hardness and they haven't been doing that in a few years. Uh, although one guy says they do it once in a while, so I don't know whether that's true or not, but that'd be a question to ask if I ever go back there again. And fluoridation no longer done. So last thing to mention, of course, is they monitor things and they actually monitor the water quality, um, you know, as it's coming in and they, they measure the turbidity, turbidity along the various steps of the procedure. They have these little uh, turbidity meters uh, all around the, uh, the plant. Uh, they're tapped into the computer and they can, uh, you know, see how each system is working and how efficient it is. And if it's not working, uh, they can adjust things. So the flocculation, for example, uh, you can imagine all the different variables. You've got the amount of chemical, you got the, uh, the speed of the mixing, you got the temperature of the water, all these variables can be changed to uh, kind of optimize the, uh, the treatment and reduce the turbidity. So I think I have um, a little chart here, talks about some of the, the parameters that are measured. Um, the main things they measure are total dissolved solids, color, temperature. They're often, you know, they're measured uh, there on site. Uh, many other things are measured by, uh, they're sent to a lab externally, and they're looking at all these other things. You can see arsenic, chromium, benzene, all sorts of other things, uh, just to, uh, to see how their treatment is doing. So um, let me just take a peek here. Yeah. So by the way, uh, um, your final exam, haven't figured out what the question is going to be yet. Um, but for your final exam, you're going to have one major question on water treatment. So uh, I don't know if it's going to be exactly like this. This is a study question. Study questions tend to be a little bit more um, open-ended. Uh, but uh, I'm going to give you a choice. It's going to be either drinking water treatment or wastewater treatment. You can choose one or the other uh, questions. And uh, it, it's going to be a big question where you're going to have to explain something to do with the processes. So, for example, what I've done in the past, and I may do that again, uh, is ask you to draw a diagram or flow chart um, of a typical water treatment plant and, uh, and describe the, the processes. So there's a, that's not a hint, that's a promise uh, for your final exam. So make sure you can explain um, in detail at least one of the processes, either drinking water or, or wastewater treatment. 